Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and uh, once again, I'm joined by Kevin Graham. Kevin was my very special guest at the weekend, where we digested yet another failure, Kevin, uh, another drop two points, and everything that ensued. Uh, we've been looking at the news. I'm sitting here all morning waiting for a ticker tape with breaking news to come up in Sky Sports uh, with Charles Patterson standing outside Celtic Park with a report. Is it going to happen? No. I, I say it's at the final whistle on the on Saturday. I didn't think it was happen, it would happen. And nothing that's since that 48 hours has changed my opinion that anything is going to happen. Uh, the silence, as they say, is uh, deafening. Um, it's, it's very difficult to actually see any other outcome rather than them giving Neil more time to actually turn it round. Um, I think, as I said on Saturday, I think they would be admitting that they got it wrong. If they if they don't give Neil time to turn it round, I think part of the, the thinking will also be that um, he's got a chance to win the quadruple treble. So I think they'll give him a... I think they'll give him to... December the twentieth and possibly the second of January, and if we get beaten in the second of January, I think they'll make a change then. If they've got to make a change at any point, I, I think the big issue with that, Kevin, is that it's too late. It will be too late by then to salvage the season because the quadruple treble isn't about this season. It's just obviously the unusual circumstances that we're currently living through means that we're playing a game that's been carried on, but that isn't this season. This season is going off the edge of a cliff. Um, some people are saying it already has gone off the edge of that cliff. So waiting until the 20th of December, and I know that's not what you would do, you're saying this is what you think the board will do, or waiting until the turn of the year, I think it's too late. There's nothing at all justifying the change not being made. It's not as though this is going to be resolved. The culture is not going to be turned round. The comments that Neil Lennon's making almost... Um, you know, routinely now after a poor result. So I was looking at the post-match yesterday, Kevin. Uh, here's some of the language that was being used by Neil Lennon to describe the performance and also the, the players. Now, some of this is contradictory, but awful. He said he was angry. He described the defence as being slack. He singled out Scott Brown, his captain, uh, for criticism. He called again the performance lazy. They've got to look at it themselves, said Neil Lennon. Well, that's your job. You've got to analyse it. And I don't know how big a part of uh, the coaching uh, process analytics currently are because it came as a surprise to many that he said that they didn't normally watch the game back um, a few weeks ago. It has to be better. I mean, how simplistic does that sound? It has to be better. Well, everybody knows that. How are you going to make it better? Uh, the essence of the game, said Neil Lennon, wasn't a bad performance. So after saying all of this, he then said that the essence of the game wasn't a bad performance. I found that astonishing. Um, he, he described the Motherwell game as a great win at Motherwell. This is verbatim, by the way. And he went on to describe the overall performance against Hibs, and this is what I mean by the contradictions, as really poor. So there's mixed messages all over that, Kevin. What do you make of Neil Lennon's input in the post-matches, particularly after a bad result? I said last week that the, the messages that come out of club regarding lots of things are mixed and contradictory. And after the game at Easter Road, it was no different. Once your manager uses the the to describe his own team as lazy, lacking hunger, questions the attitude and questions the culture. And he does it not just once, but on numerous occasions this season. It's, there's only usually one outcome. And the outcome's not good for the person that's actually saying those things. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to actually see. You can't look. Those comments are of a man who seems to have lost the dressing room. Those comments are, are of a man who is at the end of his terror with what's going on, and he knows. And he knows that he can't turn it round, or he's looking at that dressing room and go, "I've got nobody on my side here anymore." Is even Scott Brown on his side anymore? You look at Brown's mistake on Saturday and look at Brown's body language after it. There, there was no complaint, no nothing. It was a shrug of the shoulders, head down. Um, you, you look at the game against Aberdeen and the game against Tibbs and, you, and you've got to, why you can question the player's mentality 
all day of the week, you've got to maybe give them slight praise. Because the fact is, when we, when we went 2-1 behind the Aberdeen and we managed to get back into the game on Saturday... Our attitude was fine to get back into the games, but it shouldn't take it shouldn't take them to that point of the game to get into that stride, get into that attitude. And how many times over the last eighteen months has Neil Lennon actually said to us, "We started off slowly. I don't know what's happening there," and you go, "Well, it's your job to know what's happening there." Mm-hmm. There seems to be a right lack of proactive coaching and a right a right lack of proactive um, ability on the pitch. I said at half time on Saturday that I feared what would happen if we went one nothing down. Well, it seems as if we have to go one nothing down now before we actually get kicked into life. We seem that we need a setback, and you can't keep on going like that. You, you can't. Uh, you're, you're eventually going to get caught out. If the Hibs game on Saturday was a one off, you'd be looking at it going right. That was great mentality. Come back for two down with twelve minutes to go at a hard away venue, but when you actually look at the bigger, bigger picture, it's part of the problem, that the fact that we had to go two down before we came back, and it's, it's a shame, it is an absolute shame to see Lennon looking out of out of ideas, talking in riddles, doesn't know himself what he's actually saying, it doesn't look like he knows himself what he's actually saying, there's no clarity from him. So if there's no clarity from from him in front of the camera, what's he like behind the scenes? What is he giving the dressing room clarity of what he expects from them? Are the dressing room now even listening? And that's the biggest question. And if the board, Dermot Desmond, are going to act, the phone call that they will make, will they be to Neil Lennon or will be to Scott Brown? And they'll go to Scott Brown. Is this dressing room going to react for Neil? And if Scott Brown says no, then it's game over. Well, can I ask Kevin, I think you make a good point there because you need to, you obviously need, if someone is, is scratching about to save their job, right, and you ask them their opinion, you're not going to get the true story of the, the feeling in that dressing room. But when you look and you analyse, and it doesn't need much um, analysis, the post-match after Ferenc Varos, where he's talking about players looking to leave the club and it's been bugging him for some time, that was his words back then, it's at that point that you think there's a problem here. There's either a divide or a split in the camp or that famous um, descriptive term, he's lost the dressing room. That's where you start thinking that, isn't it? Back in the Ferenc Varos uh, aftermath. Now, I spoke to uh, Jim Orr about this. I spoke to a couple of other pundits about this terminology, this losing the dressing room. Um, and Anthony Haggerty, who who was in, obviously, a journalist of uh, decades experience coming in uh, as a guest one day, what does it actually mean? Does it mean that there's a group of players that absolutely... And how big a group is that player, uh, that player group? Because we've seen it during the Ronnie Dyla era, didn't we? And it was the senior players. So mm-hmm. Ronnie seemed to be able to motivate and tap into players like Kieran Tierney, Callum McGregor, etc. The younger crop of players bought into Ronnie Dyla, whereas the older senior pros weren't interested. So Charlie McGrew, Chris Commons. Interestingly enough, Scott Brown was, was part of that culture, right? Um, and as you said there, I think that what you've seen, and we're not um, body language experts, Kevin, but it is a concern when you see the reaction of Scott Brown having given away that penalty. And when you look at the, the most senior pros, and that that is the, the kind of body language, that's the message that they're giving us as supporters watching us from afar, not feeling as though we could actually uh, make any difference to that game. And then after the game, the gaffer has a dig at Scott Brown. The, that would suggest to me that there is definitely a divide, a split in the jet dressing room, or indeed Neil Lennon has lost the dressing room. Is there any coming back once you get to that stage? Because I was at that stage after the Ferenc Varos game, Kevin. I was asking these questions that you're asking today. Is there any way back once you get to that, that stage? Uh, there's no way we're going to ship out half a dozen players no, no, there's no way we're going to ship out half a dozen players and we've seen we've seen this story so many times at so many football clubs that footballers can get that footballers can get their manager the sack. If the if the play if their workplace is unhappy, then they can get the man who's making it unhappy for them the sack. That's the way that's the way football is, unfortunately. And the, the footballers will get away with it. And because they could just go on and perform for the next manager, if they've got a if they've got a 
enough ability, which I think there is enough ability in our dressing room. As Brendan Rodgers proved when he came in after Ronnie Dyla, if you get the team to buy in with what you actually, of what your philosophy is, then they buy into it. I mean, you look, you're talking about the body language. Look at the body language of Frank Paul and Beaton at the right. penalty kick. Yeah. They, 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 there was an acceptance there that the keeper's not going to save this. There's an acceptance there that they're already that that we're already one nothing down. I mean mm-hmm. that's utterly ridiculous for two professional football players to be standing on an eighteen yard box at a penalty kick with the hands on the hips. Uh, that and as you say, we're not body language experts, but for me that says a hell of a lot of what the culture likes in that dressing room. That they're standing there and be on switching off. I mean, you can look at the two goals. Beaton's um, niggly free kick, which leads to the ball into the box for the penalty kick. There was no need for him, there was no need for him to bring down the guy. Uh, Christopher Ayer had the boy, and he was ushering him out of play. That was just a petty free kick. You look, you look at the, the second goal as well. Beaton doesn't react to Nisbet breaking into the box, even though it's clear to everybody in the world that Fung Pong and Christie are losing that header. Well, they're not even contesting the header. They're too busy looking at each other going, well, you go, no, I'll go. It's a bit like that old, uh, the, who was it, the Chuckle Brothers? The two Chuckle Brothers standing there looking look, look at them. Eh? Um, so when you see stuff like that happening, you go, well, what's going on? Well, what is... The team don't look prepared. They don't look to want to go that extra mile for the manager. And usually that means that you can't get that back eh, unless there's a complete and utter clear layer. Um, you, you, you remember the story about eh, John Hughes telling you the story that he switched the, dre- the dressing room lights off and let everybody punch 11 daylights at each other for 30 hey. seconds. And they switched the lights back on. That was an interesting uh, management technique, Kevin. I've ever heard one, but... Um, Thanks for sharing it with the world, I John Hughes did certainly share that with us. But I think I think the, the big problem I've got here, you're, you're talking about a, fa- a failure to react. There's a failure to react in the highest echelons of the club, Kevin. There's a failure to react after the Ferenc Varos game, after the Rangers game, and it goes on with one, two and eight. Uh, moving into the, the realms of the first game against Rangers this season, Neil Lennon was sitting in his second tenure with an 80% win rate. That's plummeted. That's plummeted since then. Um, and I think that all, what's also plummeted is that there's a lot of goodwill plummeted as well because um, I think the reaction that we got as a podcast after the Aberdeen 3-3 game uh, when we had a similar discussion and a similar point to the, the game just passed there against Hibs, it's night and day regarding the reaction. So after the Aberdeen game, uh, probably 60-40 against um, Neil Lennon's departure. But looking over the weekend, the kind of reaction we've had from our podcast has been much more 90-10. There's very, very few people disagreeing now. I've seen loads of names bandied about, uh, but before we go to that, and I think it is probably time to look at it, because you know people were asking this, Kevin, at the weekend, if Neil Lennon goes, who do you replace? And I said at the time, it's not a, it's not a job that, that you're going to have trouble finding people to, to take. It's a job that it's an attractive proposition. Now, what you've got there is, You've got an opportunity um, to to write yourself into the club's history. You've got an opportunity for that then to either put yourself in the short window a la Brendan Rodgers. We all know that's why he took the job in the first place. Or for it to be a more long-term project. But the big issue that I would have with that is what's our plans for January? Is there a contingency with regards to a player budget? And if so, don't be letting Neil Lennon buy any players with it. Actually give that budget, right? Give that budget... Um, to the powers that be to find a manager with it. Because I don't think, going back to what you said about the squad, I, I do still believe the players are there. I don't think that uh, man for man, we're a worse squad than we were last season. Would you would you take Johnny Hayes over Lick Salt? I don't think anyone would, right? Would you take, here's one, uh, Sumunovic over Duffy? A lot of people are probably sitting nodding their heads at this moment in time. On paper, Duffy was the, was the signing, wasn't he? He was the guy that, that would be a better signing. It's not worked out yet for Duffy. The one argument, I guess, would be Foster against Barkas. And that's one of the biggest issues that we'll cover in relation to the starting lineup at the weekend. But a failure to add, here we go. So we go one nothing down, Kevin, 50 minutes into the game. Um, actually, the failure to act was at half time when I says to you, changes had to be made there because we could play all day and not break this Hibs side down. 
playing the personnel in the shape that we had set up in the first 45. But um, as expected, they made no changes. So 50 minutes into the game, five minutes into the second half, we go a goal down. So, yeah, you can look at the lazy reaction of players like Frimpong at the penalty because, um, you know, Murphy wanted the ball before anybody else after the penalty was saved. Seven minutes it takes. Seven minutes it takes for Neil Lennon to react to that. And the reaction is a like-for-like change, right? So he's not changing any shape. He thinks at that point, the team that's failed for 57 minutes is going to turn it round. The shape is going to turn it round. And it was probably a change that he was going to make anyway because I ate, he was rotten. So right. you would have said that he was going to make that change round about the same time anyway. I would say that. Yeah, no, you're probably right. I don't think you get the best out of Ayeti playing as a lone forward anyway, Kevin. And it's something we've spoken time and time and time again about. There's four strikers in the starting 20 um, in terms of the squad. Starting 11 with the nine subs. There's four strikers who play one of them. One who, it's been proven, doesn't play well as a lone striker. But, you know, it's this continued um, failure to see what's going wrong and continue to do the same thing and hope that it, that it resolves itself. So we go into 58 minutes, Kevin, right? 58 minutes, a minute after we make the the AFA reference the substitution. 71 minutes before we make a change after the second goal. That's 13 minutes to react, Kevin. 13 minutes. When we pull it back to 2-1 and the, the, the penalty kick, I'm pretty sure we'll be hearing from a resident Hibs fan who comes in and comments, soft, I, I guess it's a soft penalty kick, but we'll take yeah, it argument. under the circumstances, right? We, we pull a goal back, Kevin, but it still takes nine minutes for us to make any changes. It's just that it's a basic failure to, to react to what's happening in front of you. He just hopes that things will resolve themselves. See, this, this is where I miss going to games because I would love to have seen what was happening on the bench um, when we go behind. Who's talking? What, what's 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 the uh, what's the communication like between the three coaches? What what's actually going on? And you can't see that from the TV. You don't know. All, all you see is when the subs are coming on. You see Gavin Stratting and got John Kennedy sitting slumped in the big seats. You, you don't see what's happened before. What's happened after it? I mean, you talk about Eddie there. Eh? So Neil uh, Neil Lennon says that he's going to speak to Edward. Uh, to say why does he play for the French under twenty ones and doesn't he play for Celtic? Well, I take it he didn't like his answer while he was on the bench. Yeah, he did say that. Yeah. Uh, so, so I take it the conversation never went the way that Neil wanted it to go. Uh, well, if that's the case and that's the reason for him being on the bench, then it's absolutely critical and crucial to the the final result, Kevin. But you made a point there regarding the the coaching staff. If you look over there uh, currently, uh, we're talking about demeanour body language, um, charisma, all of these things. Neil Lennon, John Kennedy, Gavin Strachan, which one of them is actually going to fill you with motivation? Any of them? Which one of them is going to give you a jag or, or any kind of spark? When, when Lennon was appointed, and again, I'm not going to say nothing that I haven't said previously, I thought he was always there as a face, as a motivator, and Kennedy was kept as a tactical brains because Kennedy maybe didn't have enough uh, personality um, to be the manager at that point, at that at that critical juncture where the where we were actually plunged into chaos when Rogers left, I still think that the long term plan would have been that John Kennedy would have took over as manager. And now I can only go by what you've heard and what I've heard. As similarly, Kennedy's well liked. He's a similarly he's one of the best coaches in the game. He's very extremely modern um, and he was favourite to get the Hibs job and he turned down the Hibs job because Celtic wanted him to stay before Jack Ross. So he must have something, but we, we're not seeing that. It. it doesn't look like he's got any relationship whatsoever with uh, Neil Lennon when you see the cameras cutting to them. And there's like, there was, I can't I remember what game there was a shrug of the shoulders when they were trying to make a substitution. Twice. Uh, you're, you're going, Twice. Well, Two games. Aberdeen and Motherwell, we've seen that. Uh, so you're like, what's going on? That doesn't look like a decent working relationship. That looks like a relationship. Now, this is only me saying this. This is not based on any fact, rumour, or any other wild accusations. It looks like Kennedy's thrown him under a bus. Well, well, it's your decision, mate. You, but, you, but you, you, see that point that you make there, though, is similar to the one I've been reading about how 
players aren't invested in 10 in a row, etc. And and by the way, I understand that comment because as fans, it's a hugely important milestone. Milestone? Um, will we ever reach it? Um, for for fans, because of the, the importance historically of the nine, the manner in which um, Rangers won nine, and I put one in inverted commas, and then obviously the 10 being able to wash that all away because then you become the, the record holders and the dominant force. You continue that domination. So it's important to us as fans, of course it is. But to win um, the league and qualify for the Champions League, Kevin, forget the, you know the historical relevance um, at the, for the moment. For any professional footballer, I don't think that anyone doesn't take that seriously. So if you remove the, the reference to 10, winning the league is as important to Edouard this season as it was last season and the season before that. If you're a winner and you win the league and it gives you the opportunity to go to the Champions League, surely there is absolutely no difference to the attitude in terms of whether it means anything to them. If you're playing for a struggling side in a Scottish league, which already isn't really regarded in, in the highest echelons of, of the elite clubs, and you don't win that league, if, you, if you're playing second fiddle, then the chances of you getting that big move are going to be lessened. So I don't subscribe fully to that, even though I'm pretty sure it doesn't mean as much to them as it does to us in terms of the 10. Winning the leagues is important to all these players because it doesn't um, bode well for them in their next move, if that is what their ambition is. And I'm pretty sure Edward's next ambition is outside of Celtic. Now, what I'm keen to do today is go through as many of the comments coming through as possible, Kevin, because we're, we're in such an emotive stage of the season um, and in Celtic's history that I want to give as many people a voice as possible. But um, you can crack yeah. on with your point before I do that. What you're saying there, that we're in the league, well, these players have already won everything they won in Scotland. What happens now if the place that they're going to work is completely poisonous? They're looking at it, you've got guys wanting to leave, guys that were maybe promised that they could have left, hasn't happened. No, it's not a very nice place to work anymore, so they just want to go. It doesn't matter if it's another league title or another cup, they've already got that. Their move is still going to happen because they've, still, they've already proved their ability for that. You've got to look at that. You've got, well, to, look at, you've got to look that they've maybe just switched off because, well, it's not a very nice place to work. Look at Tom Rogic. Now, Tom Rogic, when he was on the top of his game, the teams he was being um, linked to, Kevin, were in the the EPL. The teams that he the team that he almost joined, and he was very close to joining, was nowhere near that level. So, if you're out the picture, and you're not getting a game because you're in the half and you've thrown the toys at the pram, or you've given up the ghost. It doesn't benefit you. It doesn't benefit the next big move. Who's going to sign Edward? Seriously, you know, under the current circumstances, are they going to sign him based on a couple of performances for France? Under 21s, you know, I think that's due, especially under the circumstances that clubs are operating in, in terms of a financial situation. He needs to be firing on all cylinders for his club, because if they see somebody with a bad attitude, now, it didn't put Liverpool off when they signed Van Dijk, who, for all intents and purposes, had gone on strike. It didn't stop them, you know, splashing out 80 million quid for him. But they, they might look at somebody and think, well, do I need that bad egg in my team? If he's thrown out the, the, the toys at the pram and he's refusing to play for the manager, does, I, does a team like Aston Villa really need a, a Edward in a team? Uh, because, by the way, there's no team above Aston Villa are going to be interested in odds and Edward. I, I don't think it really matters. I think clubs will always get... Club, clubs will always take chances on players. They know how the game works. They know that players are huffy. And I don't think it really matters. Edward will move back to France just because of what he does with the French under-21s. And he'll still get the same move whether he plays for Celtic or not. He'll still go back to France. I've said that for and I've said that for long enough. I don't reckon he's going to England. His next move is not to England. His next move is back to France. Well, I think uh, it would be wise for uh, Lyon to marry him up with Dembele, but hopefully not this January, because I think the way that you get a tune out of Edouard to the end of the season is with a change in management. And I'm going to run through some of the names, the runners and riders who have been quoted over the weekend. And um, uh, obviously one of them is, is the guy who's uh, been quoted to us from a source. So we'll, we'll speak about some of the names. And, you know, 
what they would give Celtic could they turn this around uh, just your opinion Kevin we'll run through them and we'll get some of the points from the listeners as well but first point is coming up through YouTube and if you are watching on YouTube make sure that you subscribe because it's free of charge and we are going out on a daily basis on the YouTube channel we also have a massive weekend a charity weekend for the quadruple treble and uh, to sponsor uh, the event because we will be able to offer sponsorship deals for each hour on the Saturday, Kevin, and then all the hours leading up to the game on the Sunday and then afterwards. And then contact Kelly at State of Mind Media um, and the Gmail, or sorry, the email account is underneath on the ticker tape. Looking forward to that weekend. We've had quite a few people signing up to it, Kevin. There'll be more announcements. Other podcasts are getting involved. We'll have ex-players, high-profile Celtic fans from all over the world will be getting involved. And it's a massive weekend. It's a huge weekend, the 19th and the 20th of December. But I still feel that between now and then, you can change the manager you can still change the manager now Sned's 1967 gaming benchmarks uh, afternoon great name even better avatar afternoon come on the hoops need Eddie Howe in Lenny ain't doing it lost the dressing room I reckon now the reason I want to have a look at this one is that uh, comment losing the dressing room Kevin what does it mean to you and can it be turned around if you lose the dressing room can you turn it around I don't think a meeting's going to turn this round no I think he's made that a I think he's made the comments too many times after too many big games. I think he's thrown the players under the bus, as we are known to say too many times. Um, he can't. He just can't come out slaughtering the players after every game that that he didn't get a right result and get them back on side. I mean, the players are. I mean, he's. He, Neil Lennon says that he used to he used to deal with twenty year old men, and now he deals with thirty year old schoolboys. Maybe that says it all uh, with the troubles that he could be having behind the scenes. Um, I think it speaks he, volumes. He, that speaks as volumes. A, as, as you see it in every football club over all around the world. Once the once the players stop trying for the manager, don't buy into the manager, then it's game over. It is game over. See what you've said there, that comment I think speaks volumes because unless as a manager you adapt to that, because that's basically a change in, in mm-hmm. attitudes across the globe in terms mm-hmm. of football. If you can't adapt to that, Kevin, in the way that you treat these players or deal with these players and you just continue with your approach, you're a bad manager if you can't adapt. Now, the other side of the coin is that some great managers, and I mentioned Alex Ferguson, um, what he used to do is he would rotate the actual second in command and the second in command would be the guy that would be the buffer and they would be the one that, that could deal with the change in attitudes and the change in outlooks of the players. Alex Ferris can, could still be an old-fashioned manager but it didn't matter because he had a buffer between him and the players. Neil Lennon doesn't have that because as you say, I think the, the coaching staff when you look at that dugout is fragmented. It's like four individuals Right, with four different game plans. That's what it looks like to me. Um, and as I said at the weekend, and I don't change my view on this, the only one out of the four I'd keep is Stevie Woods. The only one out of the four I'd replace the other three, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Now, Stephen Forbes, who is commenting on YouTube, has contacted us to say, from your time covering and following Celtic, how does the current situation compare with other eras in the club's history in terms of the intensity of debate and sometimes the vitriol? I'm five decades in. Now, Stephen, you're a man after my own hearts because I think I might have mentioned this already. I've watched Celtic in five decades and so is Kevin. It's quite embarrassing, really. We're getting old, mate. Um, right, where does it compare? I mean, I don't want to be referred to as a Celtic da, but obviously you go back to that period and there was a lot of vitriol flying about. But don't forget, there was a lot of vitriol flying about in Fergus McCann's time, Kevin, at various mm-hmm. various parts of that. Because as soon as we had the stadium and the club was saved, it was all about, right, buy players keep the canio. You remember it, give them the money. Right. This whole thing, and, and you, there was a reluctance, so even if you go back to the stopping the 10 season or winning the one, whatever way you look at that, when you look at the players coming in, the Celtic fans were highly enthused with what we were bringing in at that point. Henrik Larsson included. I mean, I think we were familiar with Larsson because his exploits with, with Sweden. But we were bringing in guys like Darren Jackson, Stefan Mahe, who was pretty unknown. Uh, Bradford City's third choice goalie. Right. You know, but we were able to um, obviously later on in the season bring in players like Paul Lambert and Mark Reaper, who made a massive, massive difference to the squad. Craig Burley was the other one, obviously, that came in. But 
where where was the the vitriol? I think it's it's been there. It's been there, not maybe as intensely as around about the takeover time in the obviously the early nineties. I've had to say the nineties. Sorry, everybody who's tuning in. Um, but yeah, I think it's getting to that point where it's it's highest levels that I can remember. Uh, but again, that might be because everybody's got the ability now. Kevin, to, to vent that vitriol and put it out there on an instant basis. Uh, sometimes it's difficult, for example, after right after a game to go live because you still got you're in that that realms of being emotional about the game. Mm-hmm. Whereas you don't have a time to go away and, and think about it, maybe type up an article if previously you were working for a fanzine, you know, mm-hmm. or maybe a blog. So I think that intensifies it as well. What about yourself? Has this been the most intense period of vitriol that we've we've seen as Celtic fans? I, I think social media makes it completely different and com- uncomparable to anything that we've seen previously. Also, having no fans in the ground, I, 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 there, there is a line of thought that if fans were in the stadium, Neil Lennon would have been gone by now. And I, I don't, I, I maybe don't a hundred percent agree with that. But I think when you got fans in the stadium, you get a different feeling of what's actually happening. Online, it can sometimes feel a bit fake, a bit false. You don't know who's actually commenting. You don't know if they are Celtic fans, if they, I know the majority of them will be, but you, but you don't actually know. You, you kind of get the feel of it. It feels sometimes amplified because it's only a small, there's only a small percentage of people's comments that you're actually reading. And I think to try and gauge it, it's quite difficult without having the match go and support there, who are there week in, week out. And that's not to say that anybody that can't make the game's opinion is not uh, is not just as viable as somebody who goes to the games. I do think sometimes that the board would react or the owners or whoever it is reacts more to the crowd inside the ground than what they can do with social media. Because they can just shut off social media and say it's not real, it's fake. It's it's noise, it's nothing. Whereas if you've got 30,000 inside the ground booing and, and uh, shouting abuse, then it's completely different. So that's where we were in the 90s. You knew it was vitriolic in the 90s because the 18, 19 of thousands of us that were still there, uh, nearly at the bitter end, were actually venting our frustrations, either in the car parks or in the stadium by throwing Mars bars at both I was members. just about to say that. Yeah, I mean, I think it got it to its very worst, Kevin, during the 4-2 game. That's the yeah. game you're talking about. It's the New Year's game, that, yeah. Aye, 4-2. Yes. I think that Celtic gate, uh, goals were scored by Nicholas and Collins, weren't they? Um, but they were, were they 3 nothing up after 20 Hell, minutes? Was, so, yeah, aye, it, was, it was horrific. It was absolutely poisonous that day. The atmosphere yeah. just... We went into that game a wee bit of hope to. Uh, <laughs> that was the worst thing. And we were 3 nothing down, absolutely battered. And the place just turned. That, that that was the beginning and the end. That that was the beginning and the end. That day, I remember there was guys fighting each other in the Celtic end. Mm-hmm. I, I just I just went completely mental, and you still had guys back in the old board. You still oh. had like because it's quite hard to for human beings to accept change. It is quite difficult, especially when it's something that's in, institutionalized in your life. Now, that's an interesting point because obviously you know. In time, people rewrite history. There's a bit of revisionism, Kevin. A lot of that's natural. It happens naturally, you know, when uh, you look back uh, with rose-tinted spectacles. But there's people on our uh, our panel who admit that they were all for keeping it as it was. They didn't want newcomers to come in, i.e. Fergus McCann, and obviously the other regime that was was looking, the other consortium with Jerry Weisfeld and all that, um, who were looking to take over the club. You, you know, they were looking at them, um, you know, suspiciously because we had been a family club, a family-run club anyway, for, for so long, for over 100 years. Now, when when you're trying to gauge opinion, as I say, if I look after the, the Aberdeen game, where, you know, at halftime I said, Neil Lennon's got 45 minutes to save his job, um, I think after that game, it was definitely a 60-40. In terms of the feedback we got, I think it was a 60-40 in favour of Neil Lennon to stay, right? I think after the game against Hibs there at the weekend, going by the social media, and by the way, I had to leave that till Sunday. The phone was, you know, out of bounds on Saturday night after the game. I reckon it's 90-10 uh, in terms of Lennon needs to go. That that is the feedback I'm getting from a Celtic State of Mind listeners. The WhatsApp group that we have, I don't even know how many people are in it, maybe 15, 20 people. 
Um, all I would say is anybody who was supporting Lennon before is no longer commenting. So I think it has completely turned on its head. Um, are you still of the view that Neil Lennon should stay or go at this moment in time? Are you looking for change this week? If it was down to me, then yes. But I need to get my, I'm trying to get my head in the mindset of those who make those decisions. I can't worry myself about what I would do because I can't make that decision. My worry is uh, that the board can't read the room. I don't think they can read the room. And I think they're not reading the room because there's no fans there. I really do think that there's no fans there. I've also, I've also got the absolute fear of what they would do next. Uh, and I say that after the Aberdeen game. And the Aberdeen game was a game I fell off the cliff. And I'm now still falling off the cliff, just waiting to see how bad my injuries are when I actually eventually hit the deck. That, that, that's where I'm at. Uh, we seem, as a business, we seem very good at football business, i.e. getting sponsorships. But we didn't seem very good at the business of football which has been proactive in appointing managers and uh, trying to get players over the line than planning for the future. And when you look at some of the stories this morning, not only sto stories, and you're going, surely you've got another plan. Surely you're just not thinking this morning, I'm going to need to phone somebody to actually see if they're interested in this job. Surely that should have been done ages ago. Surely, okay. surely they... But, but we know it doesn't, we don't seem to work like that. We know we don't seem to work like that. And that's what kind of annoys me more. It should worry you because when it you think back, it, it's yeah, me. when you think back to when Neil Lennon was given a job permanently, 25th of May, um, after the victory in the, the Scottish Cup final, but wrapped up another treble at that time. The, the point was made by Peter Lowell uh, that they didn't even look at any of the other applications. Right, so going back to what you just said there, surely, 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 that, that's what we would expect as season ticket holders, shareholders, fans from all over the globe. And by the way, I take your point about being at the game and venting your, your anger at the game. I do feel that an online presence can be heard. I really do. I really do feel that. I mean, when you think about um, how Celtic is represented uh, in terms of content creation, be that through podcasts, live broadcasts, blogs, etc., I think that you can get a, a, a real sense of what the Celtic fans are thinking across the board, Kevin, which maybe you wouldn't have got previously because you maybe had, back in the 90s, a hardcore at that time between twenty five, thirty thousand, 30,000, really, who were going to the games, unless it was a European game or maybe a game against Rangers. And they could they could make their feelings known. You then had some fanzines that obviously were flying the flag. But I feel as though Celtic fans do have a voice online. I mean, when you think about the amount of people that tune in, for example, even just to our podcast on Saturday, Saturday they're just about 40,000 across all platforms. That's a huge cross-section of people. Um, who are, are tuning in and actually giving us feedback and commenting and saying Lennon must go, the board must act. I've heard loads of names getting mentioned. I want to run through some of them with you, Kevin, um, and see what kind of reaction we get from the, the listeners today. But before I do so, it's going back to a point you made. Joe Porter contributes a fair bit to the, the bulletins here, so it's always great to see you, Joe, and thanks for joining the broadcast. Sad to say, but Brown looks done. He's one of the main reasons Celtic are even going for 10 but no room for sentiments. I think you're spot on, Joe. We, we can't be sentimental about this. And I think, I think that is a big thing about Celtic fans. It's actually, it is a virtue, right? The sentimentality, of course it is. And loyalty and all of these things. But it can hold you back, Kevin. And in a decision like this, what are we thinking about? Are we thinking about Neil Lennon last season? Are we thinking about Neil Lennon the player? Are we thinking about everything he's gone through for Celtic off the park, Right. Or are we going to focus on what's happened this season and the capitulation of Celtic under his watch? Is that, I mean, because for me, that's what you need to focus on. You need to focus on that, but what makes Celtic special is what makes me write about Celtic and talk about Celtic and think about them far too much is the fact that we are an utterly romantic club. We've got that, but sometimes you have to cut through that and make decisions which are good for the long-term future of the club. Now, 
you mentioned I'll be looking at Neil Lennon. Neil Lennon's been through a hell of a lot as a Celtic player and a Celtic manager. And we will, we will always be thankful for Neil Lennon being part of our history. And that's never going to change, even if this does go pear-shaped and he does end up leaving on not one in the league. It, his, legacy is not, his legacy will be tarnished for a little while, but then eventually it will be forgotten about. As all football fans do, we do eventually move on. We, we really do. But what, what you're actually saying there, it's like that old pensioner who finds his a wife dead in, dead in her bed. She died peacefully in her sleep and he continues to actually cash in her pension for six months. Then eventually gets took to court and put in jail for fraud. That's what it's like. You've got a lot of sympathy for him, but by the way, he actually stole money for six months. So so he still has to get charged with a crime, if, if you understand what I mean there. But that's, no, really. I'm not sure if Neil Lennon's the wife or the husband in that relationship, Kev. But... Husband, definitely the, de- de- right. definitely the husband. Um, but you know, you see these stories in the paper all the time, you feel sorry for the guy because he's grieving, but he's, he's cashed in a dead person's pension for six months. So he's still to get charged with it. So you can have massive sympathy for somebody, but when push comes to shove, they've got to fall on their own sword. And this is a result. This is a results business. It is, and another thing I would say is that this isn't based. Some of the comments I've seen was you can't you can't get sacked after a two-two draw with Hibs. Well, it's not about one result. It's about the entire season and all the underlying issues. Not even just poor form, Kevin. Now. You know, players come and go in terms of their form. They normally get back to good form. And I actually think players like Shane Duffy have managed properly. Um, will get back to a good level of form. I, I do believe that. But if you've got the underlying issue with, uh, you know, when you're looking at the attitude, uh, the aggravators, people wanting to leave, uh, people getting called lazy, the culture, all that adds a whole different glean onto the situation. Now, Martin Davy, sorry, but Lennon has to go with his backroom staff, Kennedy and Strachan. Joe Porter comes in to say that Celtic feel like they own Kennedy a living. And Howard Roark says, Mark O'Neill, we Gordon Strachan, God, please no. So that takes us up, I think, to looking at some of the, the names that have been flying around. Uh, and I know that there's a rumour, obviously, that... Uh, Dermot Desmond is going to fly in for um, crisis talks as to what happens next. And again, it's a rumour as far as I'm concerned. There's no proof that that's happening. But if he does and they're looking at what is going to happen, Kevin, um, I've seen a few names. I'm going to run through a few of them. I want your reaction uh, to each of them as I go through them. So let's start with the two that have been mentioned, obviously, from Howard there. Martin O'Neill. Oh, in the name of... uh... In, in the name of Mark McNally, I mean, this is this is what I was talking about. The board trying to read the room, and Martin O'Neill is a short-term solution, and one which gives me the fear, and no, no because I don't like him, no because I don't love the fella. I just don't think it's the right move, and I think it could backfire spectacularly. Okay. And that's the, that's the easiest thing to say. It's, it's harder to yes. actually say he would be an ultimate success. But if you're going with my gut reaction, I've actually got the fear with that of Aye, what could be the potential outcome. Well, he would only be getting the job out of sentiment. I mean, it goes mm-hmm. back to one of the previous... I mean, there's nothing he's done in football management, actually, you know... You know, arguably, Aston Villa, when you look at what he done with Villa, right, but that's that's a long time ago now. Um, there's nothing since Aston Villa that would suggest that he would be a success at Celtic. So that would be a no for me, Gordon Strachan. Again, exactly the same as O'Neill. Uh, we, we've had the, the pleasure of meeting Gordon recently, and he's a fantastic guy, but they want him back in charge of Celtic. Again, it's another short-term fix, which... No, I'm sorry. Again, he could turn it round. He could go in there and get that team back to basics and get that team over the line. Uh, but again, it's, it shows, it, it, it goes back to what I say. We're great at football business, but not great at the business of football if they're the two names that are actually getting bandied about. Well, Gordon Strang, as you say, we did have a pleasure of having his company. Um, seems like a long time ago now, Kevin, but it was this year. And he told us, in on no uncertain terms, that he, he did not want to return to football management at that stage. He's been at the game for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, what would the flip side of that be? Well, anybody who plays under Gordon Strachan is 
of supreme fitness because that is one of what that that is a prerequisite of being a Gordon Strachan player. Are Celtic lacking fitness at the moment? Is that part of the issue in terms of the culture? I've heard a lot of fans saying it looks as though they are. Uh, what is Neil Lennon's kind of take on some of the more um, modern methods? I know that Strachan has been involved at Dundee in terms of youth development, Kevin, and what they're doing up there. So it's not as though he's out of touch. He's got international experience, he's got club football experience, but again, I think we're getting stuck into this world of sentimentality. I don't forget the last season under Strachan, it was woeful. The football we played was absolutely painful to watch, and I can't can't forget that, you know. So, yes, are we just thinking about the two last 16 Champions Leagues? Are we thinking about the three in a row? Probably. For me, it's a no. It's a very simple it's, it's a very simple link to make, and I think that's how the papers and certain sites have made it, because these two guys, these two Celtic greats, one of them's a legend, one of them's a great, if you want to argue about which is which there, um, but they're available and out of work. They're available to come in and be seen as a steady hand to steady the ship, and it, it just it doesn't solve nothing. It doesn't solve nothing because my fear with Martin O'Neill is he brings Roy Keane with him. I think, right. they're, I think they're part as a package, and I know what you're going to say, that you've been told that Keane will never be anywhere near Celtic Park, but I can see that happening. If, if Martin O'Neill comes, Roy Keane will be on that training ground. Well, he's the next name on the list, and yes, I have been advised of that, but you know, stranger things are fat, Kevin, because we are, and this is the thing that I'll be criticised for saying, we're at a, a crisis point of the season. We're at, crit- we're at a critical point of the season where, you know, for me, that that draw, pulling it back to 2-2, two, two, makes no difference. That is as good as a defeat for me on, on Saturday, the way that we went about our business, the way that we were 2 nothing down and the same mistakes are getting made by, by Neil Lennon. So I, I do think we're at that point of crisis. I mean, when, when you're in that point, the only way you're going to turn it around is a change in management. Does that then mean that... Um, Previously, Roy Keane has said no um, to the advances of Celtic, so he was in the black book, not to be asked again. Does that change? I'll tell you what, if I was going to make a, a massive turnaround like that, it wouldn't be for Roy Keane and whatever he's done in management. Well, it depends who Roy Keane's fell out with. Has he, fell, has he fallen out with Dermot Desmond or is it Peter Wald that's saying not on my watch? And if, if it's not, if it's Peter Wald, then Dermot always gets his way. Dermot, sorry, always gets his way. So uh, if if that's only reason stopping Roy Keane coming back, coming coming to Celtic Park with Martin O'Neill, it's Peter Wall. There's only one winner. Albert McCready makes a good point, and it goes back to probably the positive I was trying to pull at the Gordon Strachan suggestion, Kevin, in terms of the fitness. I mean, you talk to people like John Hartson, for example, the fittest he's ever been in his career was under Gordon Strachan at Coventry. The pre-season that they used to go through was hellish, uh, according to John, because I didn't think running was his forte. Um, Albert says, I feel almost all the players look done. Is that a coincidence? I get that vibe as well. I think we're done out. 60 minutes in, you could probably even look at the Lille um, you know, losing the two goals against Lille. We came out, we looked brilliant, full of energy, but only for an hour. And then that all changed in the last half hour, we ran out of legs. A club like Celtic, Celtic should not be in a situation where we're running out of legs. But we've got five subs, Paul. Mm-hmm. We've got five subs to bring on. We've, we keep on going that we've got, the, we keep on saying that we've got the best squad. Well, it's about time that we've used it then, eh? if players are done in after 60 minutes. And guys like Callum McGregor and that have played a hell of a lot of football over the last four seasons. Mm-hmm. So, again, if we're looking done after 60 minutes, that goes back to bad squad, squad management and bad game management that these guys are looking done in after 60 minutes. With such a big squad that you're you're playing again, and it's a criticism that I would have against Hibs, you're playing the same team time and time again. We've played the same lineup against Hibs as we did against Motherwell. You might argue, well, what happened in between times? Well, nothing for Celtic, but you've seen that Edward went to France and looked excellent, and for me, he would have started the game every day of the week. You look at Duffy, if there's ever a game that you put Duffy back into the side, Kevin, that was it. He's had a couple mm-hmm. of good games at Republic Island. It's all about confidence. We've been hearing this from Martin O'Neill as it happens when he was a manager of the Republic of Ireland. Yet, we don't play him. So it's taken a dunt to his confidence. He then tweets out or goes through Instagram with old finger up, middle finger up, changes it. But was it a, a typo or not? Who knows? It just shows you the whole thing for me is being absolutely magnified. But Roy Keane, I, I've, I've not asked you yet, would you, would you even entertain the idea of Roy Keane coming to Celtic Park in any kind of capacity as a manager? 
I would then entertain the idea, but I, I think I might need to get my mind round to entertaining the idea of him at Celtic Park. I hope not. Is, I hope not, Kevin. The DJ of choice, again, welcome back. You're commenting on YouTube. Unless Rafa is desperate to get out of China, he's not coming to Glasgow. Interestingly enough, someone messaged me and hadn't messaged me for ages on Twitter. And you know that what then happens is you have a look at the message that you had you know, exchanged before then. And it was a week before Neil Lennon was given the job. Um, so I think it was you know the 18th or something. It was exactly a week before he was given the job. And uh, permanently, that is. And... They asked the question, who do you think it's going to be? I said, I think it will be Neil Lennon. But if it was for me, it would be Rafa Benitez. Um, if I could have somebody like that at the club, I would take that in a heartbeat. I think that's more of a longer term solution. And it might not be on the table just now. But as I was saying after the, the Hibs game, Kevin, whatever the budget is for, for players uh, in January, you know, because they must have a budget. They must have had a contingency just in case someone had a bad injury, the goalkeeper didn't work out. The centre half didn't work out. The James Forrest situation is Julian. There's got to be a contingency where in January we have a budget for going and buying players. Whatever that budget is, get get a new manager in on a short term contract. And I don't care if it's five million quid. If that's what it costs you, that's much bigger for me than a, another striker or a right winger or a centre half. Because I think a manager um, of of a standard can do with that squad what Neil Lennon is failing to do at the moment and that is to have um, a winning run, momentum the performances that we would expect when you look at the personnel so I wouldn't be spending money on January for players I'd be spending on a manager I can't shoot any holes in that statement that statement is so true it's unbelievable um, if you've got a decent if you believe that you're an elite football club if you believe you should be playing at an elite level then you should have an elite manager and Elite managers cost money. And I, I know the, the Swiss Rambles came out with a, a Twitter thread today that I haven't read yet. And it, I think it basically says we're a big club in a small pond. You had a look at last week and Dermot Desmond saying to the Atlantic League, we're no interested. Well, my spidey senses start then going, well, why are you no interested in that? Is, have you been told that we're going to get down south? You've been told that a British league's going to happen? You, so... If he wants to be as at that level, I mean, what, what's, you know what I'm doing, Paul. You know the project that I'm working on. Dermot Desmond appointed Martin O'Neill the first time because he was a, he was he was just behind Alex Ferguson and Alex Wenger, uh, Alex Wenger, uh, Arsene Wenger in England. He was wanted for every single top job in England, and it was to actually get Celtic noticed to get moved into the English Premiership. And that's mm-hmm. why he went for Martin O'Neill. It was a it was a complete and utter ego, and obviously Martin done really really well for us. And but it was a it was a statement. It was a statement appointment. The same with Brendan Rodgers. Brendan Rodgers was a statement appointment. And the next whoever is next, whenever we decide Neil's time at the club's up, has to be a statement appointment. I think the biggest statement that we need to do just now is a, a statement um, sacking. It needs to be the flip side. That's the biggest statement. We do not stand for this level of performance. We're not going to allow history just to disappear off the edge of a cliff because you've got a Rangers side who have got it together after a couple of seasons, Kevin, um, and they've got a, a unit that are playing for the manager and they're playing with a belief. And you're looking at that game against Aberdeen. I say to you, we're relying on something we're not going to expect. And I didn't expect anything from that game. Um, at Ibrox I really didn't but they're, they are steamrolling over teams like Aberdeen who you would expect to be top four at the end of the season they're having no issues with that yeah they went to Easter Road and they got a 2-2 similar to us they've dropped a couple of unexpected points against Livingston that's not going to happen very often Kevin and the issue that I've got is it is happening pretty regularly with Celtic at the moment it's not but you're hoping for a blip you're hoping that they actually tail off you're hoping that the fact that the way they play with this high intensity, high pace, the fact that they play with almost seven forwards, you're, you're hoping that some of them lose form, have a have a dip in form and they start dropping points. And you're, you're also hoping we get our act together and can go 10, 11, 12 games unbeaten, and that includes beating them. Now, Bromsgrove boy, I think, makes an excellent point. Availability is not a talent. Um, and, and absolutely, and one person that certainly isn't available, but it's the name that I've been given is Alex Neil. What's your mm-hmm. thoughts on that? What's your thoughts on Alex Neil? I thought he done well 
uh, at Hamilton. Um, I must admit, uh, he's at Preston now, is it? Aye, uh, Preston. Yes. Preston's his second job down in, down in England, eh? After Did Norwich. He, after Norwich, I couldn't remember where he went to the first time. He was a good young manager up here. He played decent football with Hamilton. Um, he seems, I don't know exactly how Preston are doing, but again, is that is that a statement? Is that a statement appointing Alex Neil? It's a long-term statement. It's saying that you're giving somebody a project to actually turn us round. Uh, Eddie Howe would be a project as well. I'm not too sure if you're going to throw Eddie Howe's name at me, but uh, uh, Eddie Howe would be a project manager as well. Um, but you're talking about Benitez. I reckon Benitez would come in right away and turn us round. Well, I'm going to I'm going to make a statement. I'm okay. going to make a statement in relation to Alex Neil. Uh, Will McMillan via Facebook, welcome to the show. Will Dermot Desmond is no idiot. He will have made contact with others. How would you have felt or how do you feel if I told you that before already made contact with uh, Alex Neil? How, how would that make you feel? Surprised and wanting to get a bit more information before I make any sort of wild, rash judgment. I'm just asking the question. <laughs> I'm not, make, I'm not making a statement. I'm merely asking the question. Now, if that were the case at the end of this season, right, and the job was done, and we all know what the job is, the job is winning 10 league titles in a row, I think I'd be open to it, Kevin. I think we need a change in direction after this season anyway. But right. at, this, at this moment in time, I don't think that's the type of appointment we need. We really need a jag in the arm. We don't, we don't need an Alex Neil maybe looking at a... a a process of three to five seasons, which I think Alex Neil is. I think that's the type of manager he would be, a more long-term manager. I think we need something short-term. It's going to cost a lot of money to get the person in that we need to make the difference. But I think that is a statement if you're talking about statements. Alex Neil in the summer or... Alex, Alex, statement. I, I, Alex Neil for me in the summer. I would listen. I'm not going to say it'd be my first choice, but I would accept it. I think what we need just now is somebody from now to the end of the season, and it's going to be an expensive one. Uh, it's maybe someone who probably doesn't want to stay any longer than that. But I think it, this is a short term fix. We need to get someone in just now to save the season. Definitely, and there, you, you do see managers that do do that, do come in and save club seasons for six months here and there, and they cost a lot of money. Your point with Al, Alec Neil one, sorry, I actually misheard it, uh, your point would be like, we were always going to fall off a cliff at the end of the season, no matter if we won 10 or lost 10. We needed a change of direction because if you won 10, Scottish, we've completed Scottish football. We don't win 10 then, well... It's it's done. It's still done as well, eh? So I agree with what you're saying. But if you appoint somebody like a Rafa Benitez or somebody of that ilk or a Gus Hiddink or a Louis Van Gaal, and I'm just throwing names out there because I know because I know that some Rangers fans will put this out on YouTube later on saying I'm shouting for them to be Celtic manager. They're just the names I'm talking about. Managers of that calibre to come in for six months. Um, then that costs a hell of a lot of money to bring those pl- bring those type of managers in, and would they be wanting to come in for six months? Probably. These well, guys money are, talks, <laughs> Kevin. Money talks. I mean, these, these guys are mercenaries. That's, listen, um, when it when it comes down to it, right? People uh, mocked me when I think you asked me the question: Who would you bring in? Well, I would I would aim at the very top of the tree as to who I would bring in, and people mock you for that. But see, when you actually pay the going rate, if you're paying their wages and you're offering them um, the opportunity to obviously manage in the Champions League, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there's very few clubs, obviously, in England. This is a big thing. If a, if a manager wants to manage in the Champions League, Kevin. There's very few opportunities when you look at the clubs in England uh, to to do that. Uh, you come to Scotland and you do the job and you do the job well, the chances are you're going to win the league and, and obviously you can then manage at the highest level. If you pay the cash, you'll get the man you want. It's as simple as that when it yeah, comes to management. And I don't mean going and getting someone who's in a top four club in, in England at the moment because that's just not going to happen. But if you have got someone in mind and there, there is a, an availability there, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're out of a job uh, because they still might be um, you know, prepared to leave the job they're in. Then as long as you're prepared to, to pay that money, you can bring that, that manager. And now I have seen quite a few people as well mentioning Steve Clark, um, you know, 
break the bank to get him. I mean, the, the thing with Steve Clark is he has been in the running for a Celtic job in the past and he wasn't given it. He wasn't offered the job. He's been, obviously, since then, I think he's continually improved as a manager. He, we always knew that he had the ability behind the scenes. He was always a number two, Kevin. You know, some people go through their whole career as a number two and do it very well. But then he's moved. He's made that step into management. Um, some people forget how well he did initially at West Bromwich Albion. You know, in his first season there, Kilmarnock, and then obviously with Scotland, would he do a job for Celtic? You know, I don't think he would actually leave his current position. He's already spoken about uh, the goldfish bowl of the Celtic Rangers, the sectarianism. He moved away from Scotland to get rid of that so that his his kids didn't have to suffer it. I don't think that would ever be on the table. No, I, I think the Clark, the, the chance to get Clark has passed. I think the chance to get Clark was when he was a number two at Chelsea and Liverpool. And I did mention before Ronnie Dyla um, that I quite fancied giving Clark a go. But now he's got Scotland to a tournament. He's, he's not going to leave Scotland to come to us. He's no Walter Smith. No, I don't think he would uh, because I think that that's a long term job that Steve Clark. I mean, it's unfinished business. Um, at the moment because he's qualified and he obviously wants mm-hmm. to see that through. There's no way he's going to give that up um, to come and help Celtic out of a, a situation that's of our own making, Kevin. Let's be honest, that's of our own making. Um, and, and the big thing as well, like you did say, our broadcasts are basically just being you know, reused on YouTube channels. That's fine. Listen, I don't mind any of these fans of other clubs having their wee bit of fun um, because the game's not over yet, but the only way that we can ensure that we have the last laugh is by changing the manager. That's not going to change for me. De- definitely. I, I mean, I sent you that video when, I, when it appeared on, on my YouTube feed. And, if, they, uh, if they think that's me having a meltdown, if they think that's me having a meltdown, they've, they, you know what I mean? They've never really seen me in action, let's be honest. I must admit, though, if the guy is watching, he probably is watching it. I liked the, the fact that you called me the illegitimate love child a gas nest, but I did. I found that quite funny. I did find that quite funny. You've got to, you've got to take some humour out of it. Uh, Stephen T and YouTube would take Alex Neil 100%. I think the issue would be, like I said before, um, was that the plan that the board had for the end of this season? Perhaps. I don't think it's a plan for now. And the question would be, can you bring that plan forward? Probably not, depending on the, the kind of compromise in terms of how much you would play in compensation. Uh, it would be a massive, it would be a massive investment to bring somebody like Alex Neil out of a club like Preston at this time. Would it change my mind or would it change your mind if Martin O'Neill came in with Sean Maloney? Massively, yes, because I'm a huge admirer of Sean Maloney and I don't write that off. I know that uh, people wrote off my sanity when I suggested Sean Maloney before because obviously you you thought the package of Maloney and Martinez is like the dream number one package. Um, Sean Maloney, Martin O'Neill, that would change, it would completely change my view, 100%. Here we go, here's a strange thought that's just came into my head. I reckon if that happened, it would be Martin O'Neill, Sean Maloney, and John Kennedy would still be there. I, I, I do think that if there's been an issue with the culture, and I'm using Neil Lennon's words here, so I'm not saying I'm in the know, if there's been an issue with the culture, you remove the entire coaching staff other than the goalkeeper coach, who I think in terms of uh, the team unit of a coaching staff like the goalies in training, they're working on their own. And you can't dispute that he's had a fantastic record, Stevie Woods, but the rest of them need to go. So it would need to be on the proviso of anybody's coming in, Strachan, Lennon and Kennedy go. For me, it's a team. It doesn't look like a team, by the way, but it, you know they're a team and they've all got to take the hit. Again, I'll go back to what I said about an hour ago. When Peter Wall has to make that phone call to Scott Brown, to see what's happening in the dressing room. And if Scott Brown says, look, we, we like we, we like John Kennedy, Kennedy stays. That's the bottom line. Well, again, Kevin, we don't know because we're just viewing it, the John Kennedy on the sidelines who's getting asked for advice and he's shrugging his shoulders. So that's what we're seeing. Um, so we don't see what's happening behind the curtain. We don't know within the inner sanctum of Celtic what's happening and what the vibe is. And if all these players who are partly agitating for a move actually think Kennedy's a good guy and they would work for him and all the rest of it. So, you know, that might be an option. It's something that, you know, I'm just looking at and I just think it would be 
um, unfortunate and unfair to just say, well, it's Neil Lennon because he's part of a coaching team and the coaching team isn't working and that team is Strachan, Lenny and Kennedy. And as I say, I, I take a different view on Woods because it's such a specialist role that he has that, you know, Woods stays in place for me. He's obviously not the issue. Um, I mean, people might argue that Barkas has been an issue. I felt that it was a perfect opportunity uh, on Saturday against Hibs to bring in Barkas and Duffy. Mm-hmm. Bring them back in. They were in my team as well, and I found it really surprising that they were not in. But then, again, I was quite impressed with Scott Bain's interview after the game when he spoke about changing his mentality, changing his, his work rate uh, and training, and he now he feels that he's ready to be the Celtic number one, which is something that we didn't see. We didn't actually see what happens on the training ground. But then I look at Scott Bain, he, he saved the penalty, but he got beat twice at his far post. Mm-hmm. With, with, and I'm going, wait a minute Especially the, 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 Jamie, the Jamie Murphy one The Jamie Murphy shot's close to him It's not, it's not as if it's a well-placed shot It's but across it's his close, body It's across his body yep. And and the, the, the Nisbet one he's, Again, it goes down to actually anticipating what's going on Anticipating where you should be Because your two defenders have let that your, That header's been won you should be anticipating where you're meant to be. There's no the goalkeeping and just saving the shots. It's been there in the right place at the right time. So actually, his anticipation was a bit off there. Now, Kevin, we are speaking uh, in, in relation to Celtic's management uh, situation. I have made my point clear. I've been watching the breaking news all morning this morning. I get the fear that... Uh, you know, a decision won't be imminent. I think it should be. I think that uh, it's a dereliction of duty on the, the highest echelons of Celtic Park if a change isn't made because they're watching um, the demoralisation of the Celtic support, uh, watching a team who seem demotivated by the management. And if a change isn't made, then they can wave by to uh, 10 in a row. But at the end of that season, it's not just Neil Lennon has to go, it's people above him as well. And that that's a big issue. And they're going to have to, um, you know, they're going to have to take that one on the chin as well. Now you were criticised. What was it you were called on that Rangers channel? Hey, I was the illegitimate love child of Gash Nesbitt. Brilliant. Um, just as a reminder to everybody who's listening, please continue to get involved and subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, we've got a massive weekender coming up. It's a charity weekend for the Quadruple Treble, where we'll be going live for 24 hours over two days, Kevin, 19th and the 20th of December. We've already had people like St Rocks, the Celtic Ray podcast, Four Tims in a podcast, uh, signing up because we're going to have one hour slots. Some of the other slots are going to be for ex-players. Um, some from the not-too-distant past who have been involved in the previous trebles, some ex-managers some Lisbon Lions, we're going to get as many people involved in this as possible we're going to be raising cash for mental health charity a homelessness charity um, also a charity that's going to support vulnerable kids at Christmas Kevin and vulnerable uh, people who rely on food banks in terms of getting some food uh, around the Christmas time so if we can help people uh, at Christmas I'm sure the Celtic fans will club in and um, we're going to continually give you more information on that on the YouTube channel so get involved if you want to sponsor the Quadruple Treble Charity Weekend please contact Kelly who's part of the team at stateofmind.media thanks everybody for getting involved keep the comments coming in get subscribing on YouTube but all that's left for me to say just now is Kevin Graham thanks again for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind Thank you, lads.